So welcome to this video. In this video I'm going to show you how to derive the PDF of the F distribution from the definition of the F distribution as the quotient of two chi-squared random variables. So I've taken these formulae from Wikipedia. So here is the definition of a F random variable, this random variable X, in terms of two chi-squared random variables. So this S1 random variable is chi-squared distributed with D1 degrees of freedom, and this S2 random variable here is chi-squared distributed with D2 degrees of freedom. And then this new random variable X, which is the quotient of S1 divided by this value D1 over S2 divided by the value D2, this random variable x is then going to be f distributed with d1 and d2 degrees of freedom by definition. And what I want to do is I've also got this formula here, which is the formula for the PDF of this f random variable x. And I want to go from this definition to this. That's the aim of this video. The aim of this video is not to explain why the f distribution matters. That's a much more difficult question than what we're going to do here. Hopefully you will have some knowledge of the fact that this distribution is important, that things that we handle in statistics do end up F distributed and hence why we do F tests. But we're not going to go into that in this video. The aim for this video is simply to go from this to this. So I've just written down the distributions for S1 and S2 here. So S1 is chi-squared distributed with D1 degrees of freedom, and S2 is chi-squared distributed with D2 degrees of freedom. And I'm not specifying what those degree of freedoms are, D1 and D2. We're going to derive this for a general D1 and D2, but of course they are natural numbers, counting numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. But our derivation is going to hold true no matter what. D1 and D2 you pick as your degrees of freedom. And indeed, you'll see that D1 and D2 are appearing all over the place uh, in this final formula. So the final PDF is, of course, going to depend on D1 and D2, but we have a formula here that will work for all of them. Uh, so we're going to derive for general D1 and D2. And of course, uh, these are going to be assumed to be independent. That's important. So S1 and S2 are independent chi-squared random variables. And the chi-squared distribution is the same, or they are special cases of the gamma distribution. So chi-squared distributed with d1 degrees of freedom is the same as gamma distributed d1 over 2, a half. And chi-squared distributed with d2 degrees of freedom is the same as gamma distributed with alpha parameter d2 over 2 and beta parameter a half. So the first thing I'm going to do is kind of trivial, and I hope it doesn't confuse you, but I'm just going to relabel up these names for these random variables. So I took these formulae from Wikipedia. So we have Wikipedia's name for these random variables. But actually, I don't want to call them that. I want to relabel them up. I'm going to relabel up S1 as the Y random variable. And you'll see why when we start to work what this app is going to be out, that I'm going to put this one on the y-axis of the graph and this one on the x-axis of the graph. That's the motivation for me renaming them in this way. So I'm going to rename S1 as the y random variable, big Y, and I'm going to relabel S2 as big X. And again, it's nicer. You could think of this one as being on the x-axis and this one as being on the y-axis, but it is nicer actually to think of this one as being on the y-axis and this one as being on the x-axis. It just means that when we want to do some integration, it more easily translates into the typical polar coordinates than if you have them the other way around. So this is the nice way to do it. We'll rename this one up y, we'll rename this one up x, and I've just put those names here. And obviously we can't call this one X anymore because this one's now called X. So we'll call the one that's going to end up with the F distribution. We'll now call that T just because I don't want to call it F, even though it would be a nicer name for it, because then we'd have to have a little F, which of course we're used to in maths using little F, not as a variable, but as a notation for function. So it'll just look incredibly confusing if I start using that as a variable, little F. Whereas little t, we're more used to using that as a variable and more used to seeing that in integrals. So that's the reason I've called this big T, so that we can have little t appearing uh, as our um, uh, value that it can take on. So in my new notation then, 
t is my random variable that I claim is, or by definition, is going to end up f distributed with d1 and d2 degrees of freedom, and t is equal to y over x, and now I've poured these constants out the front, so we've got uh, rearranging this um, division here, you get that this is d2 over d1 times this, so I've just brought this out of the denominator, so we've got d1 that remains in the denominator, and then because we're dividing by 1 over d2, it then becomes goes back to the numerator. So t is equal to d2 over d1 times y over x, these two random variables, where y is chi-squared distributed with d1 degrees of freedom, and x is chi-squared distributed with d2 degrees of freedom. And now my first objective is going to be to work out how this thing, y over x, is distributed, and then we'll put this bit back in right at the end, because that's just simple, that's just a constant times whatever this thing is. So we'll do that final alteration, that final tweaking, uh, right at the end, and firstly let's do the difficult bit, which is work out how this thing, y over x, is distributed. So we'll call this thing, y over x, the random variable s, and then our random variable t is just going to be a linear multiple of s, d2 over d1 times s. So let's work out how s is going to be distributed, and s is a nice choice as well for a name of a random variable, because we're used to using little s as a variable as well, um, so the notation won't look too um, bizarre. So we want to try and figure out how s is going to be distributed, and what we know is how x is distributed and how y is distributed, and we know that they are independent. So what we're going to do is firstly write down the PDFs for x and y, which is what I've done here, and we'll go through that in just a moment. And then we're going to think about what is their joint density function, their bivariate joint density function, and because they're independent, that's easy. We just multiply the two of them together. And then we've got this joint PDF over the two-dimensional plane. What we can then start to think about is which points in that two-dimensional plane will give certain s values, i.e. when you take the y-coordinate and divide it by the x-coordinate, you get a value, which we want to look at the locus of points that give the same s value when you take their y-coordinate and divide them by their x-coordinate, because all of those points are now going to have, they're going to be the points with a specific s value, so we can then think about trying to work out the probability that you get that certain s value, what's the probability that you're on that line. And what we'll do actually is work out the CDF rather than the PDF. It's always easier to work out work with CDFs when you're doing this sort of thing, transformations of random variables, than it is to work with the PDF. So we'll think about trying to work out the CDF for our random variable s, and that will be an integral of our joint PDF over a certain region that we'll work out, and then we can just differentiate that to get back to the PDF for s. So that's going to be our strategy. So let's firstly write down the PDFs for our x random variable and our y random variable. So x first is gamma distributed d2 over 2 a half. So here is the formula for the gamma distribution. Remember the gamma distribution PDF is 0 for the negative real numbers and for 0 itself. And it only becomes non-zero when you go on to the positive real numbers and then it's given by this. So for the positive real numbers f of x is the PDF for x is equal to We've got beta to the power of alpha, beta is a half, and then alpha is d2 over 2. Then we've got over gamma of alpha, which is d2 over 2. Then we've got x to the power of alpha minus 1, which is d2 over 2 minus 1. And then e to the power of minus a half beta. So all I've done here, sorry, minus beta x, rather, and beta is equal to a half, so minus a half x. So all I've done is just plug in this is my alpha value and this is my beta value into the standard formula for the PDF of a gamma distribution. And likewise, I've done it here for the y random variable, which is gamma d1 over 2, a half. So again, it's only non-negative when y is greater than 0, which means actually that when we take the joint PDF of x and y over the whole R2 plane, we're actually only interested in that first quadrant where x and y are both positive. Everywhere else, it's going to be 0. So that simplifies things. And here, uh, it's exactly the same formula as we've got here, except that now alpha is d1 over 2 rather than d2 over 2. So where you had d2 over 2 here, 
I've replaced it with d1 over 2, but otherwise it's the exact same formula, except of course that I've also changed the x to y here. So now what I've done is I've joined them together to get the joint PDF. So the random variable x can take on any positive real number. The random variable y can take on any positive real number. So if I want to ask what is the pair x, y, it can take on anything up in this first quadrant of the R2 plane. Everywhere else it's going to be zero because that would involve either a negative x if we're up here or a negative y if we're down here or both if we're in this quadrant. So all of the possibilities up in this quadrant though are possibilities and what's the probability of getting one of these specific points? Well it'll be given by this joint PDF which is just the product of these two because we're assuming that they're independent i.e. that the answer that you get for x doesn't affect the answer that you get for y. So I've just multiplied these two together. This is the notation I'm using for the joint PDF. And in that first quadrant where x and y are greater than zero, it's going to be given by this formula. So a half to the power of d1 plus d2 over 2. So that just comes from these two being producted together. So we've got a half to the power of this times a half to the power of this. So combine them together, you just get this one plus this one. So we get d1 plus d2 over 2. So we've got a half to the power of d1 plus d2 over 2. And then we've got over... And now we've got the two gammas here. So we've got gamma d1 over 2, gamma d2 over 2. So they've come from there. And then we've got x to the power of d2 over 2 minus 1, which is from here. y to the power of d1 over 2 minus 1, which is from here. And then I've combined the two exponentials together. So we've got e to the power of minus a half x times e to the power of minus a half y. Combining them together, we get e to the power of minus a half x plus y. Now let's think about what s is. Now this is the most difficult bit in my opinion. S is equal to y over x. So we know that the pairs of values that we can get are in this quadrant. Now let's think about for each of the points in this quadrant, what would be the s value that they would be associated with when you do the y coordinate over the x coordinate. Even more than that, let's think about the locus of points that would all have the same s value. So let's consider the s value 1, for example. So put in 1 here. Which points in this first quadrant would all have the s value 1? We well, just put in 1 here and then rearrange, bring the x up here, and you'd get it's all the points where y is equal to x. Now that's kind of obvious because you need the y coordinate divided by the x coordinate to equal 1. So obviously they're going to have to equal one another. So it's this sort of line of points here all of these points where the x value and the y value are the same, they're all going to have the same s value and that s value is going to be 1. Now if we thought about an s value of a half, again we'd do the same thing, we'd rearrange this and we'd get this equation, y needs to equal a half of x, so the y value needs to the y coordinate needs to be half of what the x coordinate is. So that'll be all the points on this sort of line with a smaller gradient, a gradient of half rather than a 1. If you thought about s is equal to 2, it would be a steeper line here. So what I'm telling you is that in this first quadrant, we are able to get all of these points and we're now thinking about which points all would give the same s value when you quotient out their y coordinate by their x coordinate. And it's these points that all lie on the same straight line. So for a given little s value, all the points that lie on the line, y is equal to sx. And of course, we're only interested in the part of that straight line that's in this first quadrant because we know um, the PDF is zero uh, on all of these three quadrants. So all the points that lie on these straight lines, they are all going to have a constant s value. So, and I hope that it'll be, it's clear to you that s can only be a positive value because if it was a negative value, we'd be looking at lines like this in the quadrants that don't exist, or, or the quadrants where the PDF is zero. We know that x and y are always positive values, so the s value, when you divide a positive value by a positive value, you're only ever going to get a positive value out. So the range space for our new random variable s is only going to be the positive real numbers. Indeed, it's also not going to include zero, because y, we've already established, is zero. Uh, the, the, the probability density of, B, of y being zero is zero. 
So the probability of relying on that line here where you would get an s value equal to zero is zero. So it truly is only going to have a non-negative PDF on the positive real numbers, our new s random variable.